Welcome to the 10th Annual Brandt Community Foundation Community Leaders Breakfast. My name is Peter Jackman. It's once again my honor to act as your MC for this great event, where each year we engage with you by presenting a unique keynote speaker, and this year is no exception. This year we have uh, Janet Jacks, who's accompanied today by her husband, Scott. I want to introduce David Bailey. David's a chair of the foundation. David's been serving the city of Brantford and county of Brant for well over 20 years. David's a businessman, community organizer, as well as being this year's chair of the foundation. David's record for fundraising is impressive, chairing the Brant United Way, Brantwood Boys and Girls Clubs Board. So ladies and gentlemen, David Bailey. Good morning. Welcome to our 10th annual uh, Community Leaders Breakfast. Um, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I would like to thank everyone for getting up so early and looking so happy. I have the honor to have been accorded the privilege of introducing our guest speaker this morning, Janet Jacks. Janet is a former elementary school teacher with a passion for educating pe uh, people about health and wellness. For more than 38 years, Janet's passion has motivated others to embrace proper nutrition, modify their lifestyles, and experience the pleasures of real healthy eating. And having had the pleasure of uh, Janet's company over breakfast, 38 years of, uh, I didn't realize, Janet, you started your career at age 11. Uh, she hosted her own radio show on CHML on Saturday mornings for over 20 years, sorting through the nutritional confusion and hype and motivating listeners to take action to achieve success. She and her husband, Scott, who is also with us today, are the founders of Goodness Me Natural Food Market, an all-Canadian family-owned business which opened in 1981. They currently have nine locations in southwestern Ontario, stretching up to Barrie, but happily including Brantford. Her passion for education means each location has a teaching classroom where cooking classes, free seminars, workshops, and educational events, including their popular Life Watcher program, are held. Janet teaches and speaks at businesses, workplaces, and community groups such as ours, to empower people to create the health and vitality they desire. Janet is the author of the Canadian bestseller, Discover the Power of Food, which includes a 10-week plan that will transform your life. A compelling and motivating read, it has over 100 recipes and is backed by 19 years of real life success stories. A second book, Share Goodness brings readers the additional recipes they've requested. She and her daughter Emily are co-hosts of the brand new podcast, The Honest to Goodness Podcast. Two women, two generations, mostly agreeing, sometimes not, with their take on health trends and health in the news, plus answers to listeners' questions and recipes to put healthy food on your table. She and Scott have five grown children, and get this, 14 young grandchildren, uh, seven little boys, seven little girls, and all under 12. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Janet Jacks. It's great to be here. If at any time you can't hear me, let me know. Um, I used to be a teacher, and I have a teacher's voice, so hopefully that won't occur. You know, I was thinking um, as I was coming here this morning, where did that all begin anyway? And I think it was when I was a little girl. Um, I liked to play school, and I was always the teacher. And somebody gave me a little stove It was about this big, not an easy bake oven. It just got hotter and hotter. It was old when I got it. I still have it. 
I don't feel it's safe to let my grandkids use it. And so anyway, I used to invent recipes. So I can see from my childhood that I'm actually living out my skills and my passion in what I do. But really, this story began uh, just uh, within the first uh, couple of years after my husband and I were married. We were called to his father's bedside because he was dying of the complications of type 1 diabetes. Until that time, I'd been a school teacher and I had a goal of continuing to teach young children and to have a big family, which I did. <laughs> but um, we were called to uh, his father's bedside because he was dying of kidney failure as a complication of type 1 diabetes. And he didn't die then, but if he had, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I would still have lived out my other plan. He lived for two more years. His kidneys got going enough to keep him going. And during those two years, he suffered tremendously. He had um, previously lost all his teeth because in diabetes, the gums can fail. He had many heart attacks. He had cataracts, and in those days, cataract surgery was a really big deal. And when the cataracts were removed, he had diabetic retinopathy, so he was almost blind. And he had to have his stomach tapped regularly because his kidneys wouldn't work and so fluid would accumulate. He had gangrene, he had leg amputation. So I saw what diabetes could do. And I had grown up in a medical family, so my grandfather, my uncle, my cousin were all physicians, and I always believed that when things got tough, the doctor would help you. But the doctor said to Bob's family, his body's going to fall apart, and I can't help him. And so that was a stark realization that there was nothing we could do um, to help him. So he died at the age of 57. And that was shocking to us because, well, he was so dear. And we didn't see how sick he was before all that happened. But if that had been the only thing that happened, still, I wouldn't do what I do. I wouldn't have learned what I've learned. And I wouldn't be standing here talking to you because goodness me wouldn't exist. But there's another part to the story that made all of that happen, and that is during the two years that it took my father-in-law to decline and die, my husband developed type 1 diabetes as well. Now, this is not the diabetes that's so prevalent today, which is type 2 diabetes. This is an autoimmune condition where the body attacks itself and kills off the pancreatic cells that make insulin. And so now we had the problem and I had to figure out what to do. You know, if we hadn't seen what happened to his dad, who always followed the doctor's rules, always weighed and measured, always tried to do what was right, and yet suffered so much, we would have followed that path too. But after we saw what happened to him, then I didn't want that to happen to our family. So now I had to figure out what to do. Now, Today, I'm sure you'll agree, there is too much nutrition information. It's everywhere, and it's conflicting, and it's confusing, and sometimes we just give up. But back then, there was no nutrition information, and I didn't really know what to do, because I thought we ate well. I liked to cook, I made food from scratch, and I thought we ate well. But I got challenged in that, and started to have a whole new idea. We'd actually gone away uh, to my parents' cottage with another family for a couple of weeks. And sometimes when you're away from your regular life, you have time to think about change. And it was while I was there um, and reading different testimonies to the power of nutrition, things I'd never looked at before, I never would have looked at, Someone brought us a big stack of nutritional magazines and started reading it and trading stories. And at first, I was absolutely skeptical. It can't be true that someone changed these things and experienced such healing. But when the stories kept coming and overlapping, I changed from being very skeptical to thinking, I think there's some truth here, to thinking, I really think there's truth here. 
and then thinking, this is what I need to do. So I came home from that two-week holiday with whole new eyes to see what I was doing, to see food in a different way. Because I thought I knew what a healthy diet was, and many of us are in the same situation. We think we know what's right to eat. And I came home, and I had a new idea, a new understanding. My eyes were opened, and I went through my cupboards, and I had to get rid of a whole lot of things because I had new standards, five new standards, and a lot of the food in my cupboard didn't meet those standards. I didn't really know what to do. I just knew what not to do. And I had to figure it out. And I have a lot of determination and perseverance. And so that helped me a lot. I just had to figure it out because I knew what diabetes could do. And I didn't want that to happen to our family. So I began to study nutrition from that time on. And there were no resources or almost none. No courses to take, no, uh, no seminars to attend. I read Nutrition Against Disease by Roger Williams, and that helped me understand nutrition against disease. What, a, what an amazing idea. Could nutrition actually tackle disease? And I pursued that idea and studied it. So I did that for a few years, and I, I started to capture information, and uh, being a teacher, put it in binders, <laughs> all um, in alphabetical, and then I needed two binders, and then I needed a filing cabinet, and it just, the information just grew, and I had to decide to put it in here because it just got too big to handle. And of course, we didn't have computers then to help us sort through and organize everything. So I just put it in this computer and just started to learn and to practice. So not only the information, but I'm a very practical person. What does that look like on my dinner table? What am I going to do with that? So it began to change the way that we ate. So uh, Scott would call me from work. He worked in the bank. He'd call me from work and say, what's for dinner? And I'd think, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm making. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, just change the subject. Um, we're having turnip, because he liked that. But <laughs> I didn't know what else. So it was a really difficult time. There was no nutrition information. And besides that, I did not have even one friend who was doing what I was doing. I was going the wrong way in a one-way street. Everybody believed this was true. And I said, no, that's not working. We have to find another way. And so I began to pursue the, um, the idea that food has power. And persevering for an answer. And so as I studied and learned, and I went to the States for a lot of different seminars because there just weren't resources available here, um, someone asked me if I would teach a course because I was learning and I was passionate and I thought, well, yeah, I'm a teacher, I could teach a course. So I uh, began teaching in 1980 and I have never stopped. I'm still teaching, it's what I do. And um, only I'm not teaching kids in most cases, I'm teaching adults about healthy eating. And um, so I did courses through Mohawk College, through the Y, um, through the library, um, and rented different spaces to continue to teach. And in the beginning, it was a one-night course. And then I'd start thinking, I wonder how Bill is doing, or John is doing, or Susan is doing with that information. I'd like to follow up. And so then I began doing two-week courses, and then four-week courses, and a six-week course, and eventually a 10-week course that we call Life Watchers. And I'll come back to that. So meanwhile, um, Scott was in the bank and we had moved around. We grew up in Wallaceburg, small town. Um, and uh, I was teaching in Tilbury. And one day he called me at work. So the principal called me out of the classroom and I went to the phone. He said, I'm being transferred. I can choose Sarnia or Hamilton. Where would you like to go? I thought, well, we've been to Sarnia. We've never been to Hamilton. Let's go to Hamilton. And that's how we ended up here. And I'm so glad that we, that we ended up in this area. And then we moved to Hamilton in 1972. And then from there, we moved around many times. We came back to Hamilton in 1977. And while we were there, Scott had this idea. I'd like to have a little business. I'd like to get out of the corporate world and have my own little business. Well, meanwhile, I'm studying and passionate and uh, about nutrition, I'm teaching about nutrition. Hey, you know what? We're driving out of town to get the food that we need. 
We need a place where we can get some of these things and maybe a few other people do too. So with that little idea, we decided we would open up a small natural food store. Um, our original uh, place that we were leasing was a thousand square feet, but at the last minute they had another little piece that we could take that was 400 square feet. So we were 1400 square feet, we're being really bold. Uh, we got a small business loan, we opened up our, our little store. and. Surprise, surprise, all these people started coming and asking questions. And I mean, I was teaching courses, but I also was teaching day by day as people came with their questions. And, um, you know, I remember on Saturday mornings, we had two little aisles. We had two shopping carts. People were lined up to use the shopping carts, um, especially if they had small children and they're waiting outside until they had an opportunity to come in and use the shopping cart. So one year into our business, when um, the space, we were at the end of a strip plaza. And when the space beside us became vacant, we thought we have to do it, we have to take that space. And so we went to the bank and all we wanted to do was borrow back the same money we had paid back over that first year. Like we'd worked hard to be on time, build good credit. We went to borrow back that money and they said, no, we're not going to lend you money. And besides, we shouldn't have lent you that money in the first place. And there we were. It was 1981. It was recession time. Uh, 1982, by the time we were expanding, and we had no resources. We had just had no money at all. We were just hanging on by our toenails. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you is that when we were going to open this business, Scott wanted to open it, I said, you go ahead. Because I'd been taking a sabbatical from teaching, and I was staying home. We had three small children. I was loving that. I was really enjoying being home with them. I wasn't one of those moms that can't wait till they're out of the house. I loved having them there. So I said, go ahead, open the business. But as the time to open it came closer, I thought, how are we gonna pay our mortgage and buy groceries? Um, maybe, okay, I will work for one year and then I'm gonna stay home with the kids again. So that was the plan. And I'll teach some classes at night, but I'm gonna stay home during the day. Well, we were just hanging on by our toenails. Now we have to expand, we have no money. And besides, I didn't realize how I would fall in love with the customers. I felt such an obligation, like I, I just couldn't leave them. They needed me, they needed the answers, they needed the motivation that I could give them. And I just couldn't leave them, so I couldn't leave. And so I said I would work one year, I'm still working now, 37 years later, and he's retired, so what happened with that? <laughs> so, you know, here I am. And, um, but we had many, uh, many, many challenges. Sometimes when you grow a business, people look at you and they think, oh, they're doing so well, they're expanding. Oh my goodness, many of you know, you've got big loans, you've got big responsibility, you, you know, just hanging on. Um, during that first year, I was the main employee. I was really the only employee for most of it. Uh, Scott would come in the morning and mop the floors before work. We had one car, so one of us had to take the bus, and he was working downtown Hamilton, and uh, our business was on the mountain. So often I was taking the bus there. He would go mop the floors, then go to work, come home after, uh, come back to work, balance the books, make sure the bills were paid. I'm filling the bins. I'm doing the ordering. I'm waiting on the customers. I'm cutting the cheese. I'm exhausted. I have three little kids at home, and I don't want them to suffer. So when I was home, I wanted to be home more. When I was at work, I wanted to be at work more, and I really felt torn. But I also felt so passionate about what I was doing. I just felt like I am really helping people, and it's really important. One of the other growing pains, because after a year we expanded, two years later, the place beside us went out, of went out of business and vacated, so we had to expand again. And I remember um, with that expansion, you know, you have retail, you can't be closed. So you had the weekend to do this work. And uh, we had, you know, the plans for the plaza and we'd hired the workers and they are digging to find the drain in this new space. They can't find the drain, it's Friday afternoon. It's not where the plan says it is. We're going down to City Hall late Friday afternoon. Tell us where the drain is in this plaza. Do you have? And you know, you wouldn't think you'd be able to find that out on a Friday afternoon, but Monday is too late. We have to have the work done and the floor put back in place and the business operating. So we had many, many challenges like that um, along the way. And um, 
I remember too, uh, we expanded three times in our first location and we were trying to expand again. We were meeting with our landlord and uh, the landlord we had was, was wonderful and then he sold it to somebody from Toronto who was not wonderful. And we negotiated, negotiated. We are trying to make something work. And I remember the day we sat down again with the landlord, our lawyer, and my husband and I, and after that meeting, our lawyer stood up. He said, you are not staying here. You are not going to be leasing from that man. He is not a good man. It's like, okay, now where do we go? We don't have a lease. If he knows we want to go, he can give us one month's notice and we have to go. How do you move a store in one month? So we had to find a place. We had to quietly, uh, we, we took a, a new plaza right across from Lime Ridge Mall and we took a section there. And we had to build that and plan that. And we couldn't tell our customers that we were moving. Because if our landlord found out we were moving, he could evict us. It was a really scary time. And so then we never realized how hard it would be to communicate in one month. We're moving. Well, our landlord was really mad. Do you know what he did? He, he wanted to pay us back because we were, we were not staying there. So he brought a, a natural, well, I guess my natural food store is a health food store from Toronto that he knew that he was friends with. He got them to open up in our old location. And when people came in looking for us, they told them, oh, they went out of business, we bought them out. Oh my goodness. But they had one employee who was honest. And so when people came in and that employee was there, she would say, no, actually they moved around the corner down there. This is not goodness me. And so we had many, many harrowing times. In the beginning, um, when we opened up our little store, the idea was we want a family business our family can run. That was the idea, just a little business. But we didn't really understand business. You have to grow or you die. Besides, customer demands were growing, so we had to grow. And uh, so we were uh, seven different sizes. We ended up moving to a different location again. So three different locations, seven different sizes. Um, and then uh, our son had... Um, he was, uh, had graduated as a high school math and phys ed teacher. He had worked for a year um, in, South, in South America. He came home from that trip and he said, you know, I think I'd like to try my hand at the business before I get established in teaching. That was at a time when it was easier to get established in teaching. And so he came into the business and that has been an amazing thing for us. He has, if you listed all the skills you wanted in someone to run your business, he has them all, and more so. And so we were very blessed. We were really careful to make sure we didn't ask our children to take on a role within the business. We wanted them to find their own way, to use their own talents. But here he was coming and saying, you know, I'd like to try my hand. And um, he's been such a blessing. So he's our oldest. We have one boy and four girls. And uh, he continues to lead the business today. Um, and, and we've been very blessed by that. So when he came along, he thought, okay, we've, we've now been seven sizes, then we expanded once more, eight sizes. And every time I said, we're not doing it again, every time we're looking for how we're gonna finance this. Uh, and he said, we need to have a, a second location. So then began the expansion. And I must say that when we came to Brantford, what a wonderful, warm reception we had. I think of all of our locations, the warmest reception. The people of Brantford were amazed and pleased and proud that we would choose to come here. And they have been so receptive of us and we are very, very grateful. Um, yeah, thank you, Brantford, for that. Um, but you know, it wasn't just the the pressures of business and of figuring out how to manage home and family along with you know, business and, and meeting the needs of people and all of those other things. There also was the aspect of helping people in their lives because that's why we began. I wanted to find a way that would make a difference in people's lives. And we, I was always experimenting with my children and with my husband, and he's been an awesome guinea pig all through the years. Um, and the things we did made him feel better, and he often would comment about that. But 
About 25 years ago, he'd gone to his doctor for his regular checkup. And when you're diabetic, you gotta make sure you do those things. Um, and the doctor said, it's time to take statin drugs. Your LDL cholesterol's too high. And what I didn't like about the way that was said, it's like, when you're diabetic, they have a schedule for you. They know you're going to get on all these drugs. It's just when. And it was like, oh, it's time. Not, um, you know, I'm sorry, your cholesterol's a little too high. Maybe we should consider. It was like, it's time. We knew this would happen. And Scott said something really surprising to, um, to the doctor, and that was, I don't want to take statin drugs. And then he said something even more surprising. He came home and said to me, tell me what to do. Well, you see, I'm a problem solver. And I always was listening to nutritional things. And in the beginning, it was all about how do you help a diabetic to avoid all those complications. But as I was teaching, people came to me. As I was working at Goodness Me, people came to me with different questions. How do I deal with my blood pressure, my arthritis, my cardiovascular risk, all these other things. And I was determined to find the answers for them as well. And so I already knew what I wanted Scott to do. But when you're a type 1 diabetic, you're taking your blood sugar four, five, six, seven, eight times a day. So you already have a lot to deal with. So I had never asked him to do these other things. But when he said to me, tell me what to do, well, I was ready. I knew what I wanted him to do. We put those things in place, and it was not dieting. It was changing the type of food. And a surprising things happened. Now, I want you to remember, all we wanted to do was tackle the cholesterol. We just wanted to lower that LDL cholesterol to a comfortable level. That was our only goal. So he'd get dressed in the morning and come down to the kitchen and look at me with a puzzled look and say, I've lost weight. Now, uh, if you know any type 1 diabetics, they're generally quite slim. Type 2 diabetics usually are, carry more weight. Type 1s are slim. Who would have thought he needed to lose weight? We didn't think so, but he said, I lost weight. A few days later, I've lost weight again. And a few days later, I've lost weight again. Am I going to disappear? And, um, but then other things started to happen. For example, he said to me one day, because he plays keyboards and he has about five of them or something. I have lost count. Anyway, he said, uh, I'm not stiff. And I said, well, I didn't know you were stiff. He said, well, I didn't know I was stiff either until now I'm not stiff. And you see, his mom had arthritis. She had knee replacements. And I think, you know, you just think, well, my mom had arthritis, so ah, I'm probably developing a little arthritis. It's in the family. And when that went away, wow. Well, now, here we are 25 years later. He's still not stiff. And he can run for an hour. And, and amazing things. And no stiffness. And then I noticed he stopped snoring at night. Now, he didn't snore a lot, and he'll tell you he didn't snore. But he used to snore a little bit. And that disappeared. And I started thinking, I think blood sugar and snoring are related. And guess what? Research has shown blood sugar and snoring are related. And he said, I have more energy. And by the way, he lost 20 or 25 pounds. And you know, he just had that little weight just around the tummy, you know? And for the guys especially, you just put the shirt out and the belt a little lower and you don't really notice. You know, and it was just like someone took a slice off the middle. And all kinds of things happened. And the amount of insulin he was taking went from 55 units to 25 units. And now it's about 20 units a day, like really low for a type 1 diabetic. And all this amazing things happened. And all we wanted to do was lower that LDL cholesterol. And so a light bulb went on for me. You know what? This is not something that just a diabetic needs to do. This is what we all need to do. Because this is going to help the person looking for answers with all different kinds of health problems. And so as I was continuing to teach people, I began to incorporate some of the changes that we had made because I knew that it would help them with their issues as well. And sure enough, it did. And I have thousands of written testimonies from people who have followed these principles and found new energy, new well-being, brain fog lifting, sleep improving, productivity going up, um, waistline shrinking without dieting. It's been very exciting. Well, I realized I needed to make this information accessible. And what I wanted to do was to bring people to my house. If I could just bring my customers to my house for a couple of days and let them stay, I think they could see how easy it is and they'd figure out what to do. That would work. But it just 
that wouldn't work. So I wrote a 10-week program called Life Watchers. And um, you have a brochure there on your table. I thought I brought one up, but I guess not. Um, a black and white brochure. And this is a 10-week healthy living program. And we, in September, we'll be starting our 20th year of, thank you, of teaching that. It looks like this. And um, so what we do is we have people come uh, for an hour and a half a week for 10 weeks, and we t give them a little piece of the information so that it's easier to follow than just throwing it all at you. We feed you, we give you a copy of my book, we give you some products that you need for that, and transformation happens. And it's absolutely amazing. The first year we taught that program, First of all, we'd seen a lot of benefits for Scott, and then, of course, myself. I have so much energy. Um, you know, I just, I know that my health has been blessed by the gift of diabetes. It's sort of a tough gift, but it has been a gift because it has taught us, like every time I cook, Scott, how's that taste? Good? Okay, what did it do to your blood sugar? So I'm constantly in training camp about what's going on, because all of us have to be aware of that. Um, and so we began Life Watchers, and the first year I taught it, I got a letter at the end of the year from a woman uh, who I'll call Trudy, and she said, I was, I'm turning 60 this year, and who has this happen? She said, I have uh, cut my cholesterol medication in half, uh, I've cut my blood pressure medication in half twice, and now the doctor wants to discontinue it. I've gotten off my um, antidepressants that I've taken for 10 years. I've had to get weaker glasses. I've been losing weight without dieting. I feel more energetic, and I'm sleeping better. Who has that happen as they're turning 60? And since that time, I've had many, many more letters. And... Um, I want to read to you one that came to me as an email. Um, the Life Watcher program is taught by several different teachers. We teach it at all of our locations of goodness me. And this letter was from a professor of medicine at McMaster. If I'd known he was taking our course, I would have been a little nervous. I wonder what he thinks. But I didn't know that. But he sent me an email four and a half weeks in. And we often find that about around four weeks, sometimes a bit sooner, people start feeling more energetic. They start feeling all kinds of benefits. He wrote me this at four and a half weeks. He said, I'm a member of the Life Watcher class. I took it because I was a little, okay, a lot overweight, as well as having a number of other issues I really didn't think the Life Watchers would address. By the end of two weeks, I was down 12 pounds. So you know we had a lot to lose if he could lose 12 pounds in two weeks. A lot of water weight probably there too. But now by four and a half weeks, I'm down 20 pounds. My blood pressure is 15 points lower. I no longer get palpitations. Walking is much easier and I feel more energetic. My knees had been bothering me a great deal, but after two weeks, they were pain-free. Hey, did you ever think that what you're eating might be causing your pain? Whoa, what a thought. But over and over, I've seen people say the same thing. I'm sleeping better, but yet more amazing to me, I realized I no longer was sneezing in response to my cats and that a chronic and mild cough had resolved. Dry and red skin on my face also resolved. All this, and I feel very full. I've grown to love the food, and I've totally bought into the lifestyle change. And the teacher is excellent. She excels in every way. Wow. That was a nice email to get first thing in the morning. And I've had so many testimonies from people, and this keeps me motivated. I motivate them, and then they motivate me. And so when I think about our journey, goodness me, it isn't just about the business struggles. It's about the passion, about finding the truth, and I always am learning so I can keep ahead of the questions that come and helping people with what I know and then seeing them come back to me with their testimony of how it's changed their life. Well, after a while of teaching Life Watchers, well, quite a few years, some people who took it said, you have to put it in a book. And I thought... Oh yeah, someday I'll write a book. But okay, I will do it. I had no idea it would take me three and a half years of hard work to put it together in a book. And I wrote Discover the Power of Food. And um, I put 100 recipes at the back. My husband said, you don't have to put recipes. Oh yes, you do. In fact, I get so many comments about the recipes. But uh, 
I wanted to write it in a way that's easy to read and follow. And you know, I was an elementary school teacher, so that's my specialty, making hard things easy, hard concepts easy to understand, whether I'm talking or whether I'm writing. And so I've been amazed at what has happened uh, and the response I've had to that book. And so when people take the Life Watcher program, they actually get a copy of the book as one of the things we give them. Um, and then uh, Bill mentioned that I did a radio show every Saturday morning. Can you imagine? For over 20 years. <laughs> and just in December, we decided to end that and switch to a podcast. So also on your table, there's a little business card size about the podcast. So uh, technology and I, well, I've had to learn technology, but um, a podcast had me a bit scared. I knew how to do live radio, but a podcast. But you know, it's been a lot of fun. We started in the middle of January with one of my daughters, and we do it together. Um, she, uh, she and I uh, often agree, disagree sometimes. And what we do is we comment on health in the news. You know, there's all these articles that come out and you hear, oh, a study says this or a study says that. Well, let's look behind the headlines. What's it actually saying? So we comment on things like that. And we try each time to give you a few simple tidbits for living a healthy life. So you can get that on iTunes or SoundCloud or on the Goodness Me website. Um, you can download it and then you can listen to it when you're in your car or when you're cooking your dinner whatever. Um, we want that to be fun and friendly and we want it to be empowering and motivating um, and so um, we hope that you'll have a chance to listen to the podcast. That's our newest venture. Uh, so I'd just like to end with, you know, why goodness me? Isn't that a silly name? Like, goodness me. Well, it embodies goodness. And we were drawn to that because when we opened our business, my husband said to me, if we cannot run this business with integrity, we're going to close the door. And so goodness embodies good integrity. It embodies good information, good food, food that's good for you and food that tastes good. It embodies treating our suppliers well. They like us. We pay them on time. We treat them with respect. We tell them if they overship and didn't charge us. And they appreciate that. They know they can trust our honesty. And it's also a good working environment for our employees. And we hope that when you come into Goodness Me, that it's a good shopping experience as well. We are there to help you and to serve you. It's good training of our staff. And we're there to tell you the truth. And that has stood us well over the years. So thank you very much for having me today. Uh, if you'd like to come back up, we have something for you. You can't eat it. Oh, thank you. This is a soapstone sculpture. Heavy, I was going to say it's heavy. Uh, done by Lorene Henry from the, uh, the Turtle Clan at Cayuga, who now lives on the uh, Six Nations on the Rivers of the Grand. It's a oh. very beautiful carving, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again for coming. It's one minute after nine. We lied, but we won't lie again. And uh, enjoy your day. Thank you for coming.